Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Foundry Church YouTube channel. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you guys do that right now. That way you can stay up to date with all the content that we show through this channel. And also we have an Apple podcast as well. So if you wanna hear the audio version of what you're about to see here, make sure you go and check that out today too. If you wanna know more that's happening kind of during the week here at the Foundry Church, we post a lot of things on Facebook. So make sure you like us on Facebook as well. With that being said, let's continue our series. Listen. So we're going to talk today in, uh, this is number four in our series on prophecy. We're going to use the life of Daniel as a context for this uh, conversation out of Scripture that we're having. Hopefully you had your devotions and you read those this week. It would have walked you through a number of the things we'll talk about. But as we lean in today, we recognize that something goes on in the life of Daniel that we can scarcely understand. So allow me to paint a picture. I need you to imagine sitting on your couch with food in front of you. It didn't take long, did it? You're like, oh, that thing I was just doing? Yeah, I can totally do that, you know? Like, right, right, you're sitting there. You got your snack, you're sitting on the couch, and then all of a sudden, ba-ding, your phone goes. You look on your phone, and it's from special agent Ethan Hunt. You're like, no way. And it says, hey, couch person eating. I Just insert your name there. Hey, I need help. I'm badly injured, and I need you to f- finish a mission for me. I need you to, to go out and meet an airplane at this place. Because last week, I was, in, I was in the Tetons, the mountains out west. I was in the Grand Tetons, and I was going to do something for the government when I was attacked by a grizzly bear. And I need you to go there. I need you to get on the plane and go. And I need you to get up to the crag where the bear went in, in his den. And he'll be able to see you, so you're going to have to have a deception. Use peanut butter. It's why he mauled me. But there's government secrets in my backpack. I need you to get that backpack out of the bear's den. But he's going to be mad. So after that, you got to climb the mountain, scree run down the other side, and there's a glacial lake. Get into the lake or he's going to eat you. When he gets bored and goes away, you move on to the extraction point. And when you get to the extraction point, you take that with you and give it to the official on the helicopter. Should you choose to accept it, this is your mission. But here's the deal. You gotta do it blindfolded. Who's gonna be like, sign me up? Blindfolded, like in the middle, you're like, honestly, I couldn't outrun a couch right now. I, I'm not going to be able to go up the mountain and do these things. Maybe if I really had to, I would. But blindfolded? How unfair does that seem? But that's exactly what the prophet Daniel faced. That's exactly what the prophet Daniel faced. In the time of the king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Now, he was the king of Babylon. They besieged Jerusalem, and they sacked Jerusalem in 586 B.C., about 600 years before Jesus. They they destroyed Jerusalem, and they took away all the nobles, and they led them off into captivity, and they put them into service of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had defeated the great Iron Age empire known as the Assyrians. They had ruled for about 700 years. They were brutal, but they had eventually fallen to the power of Babylon. And the prophet Daniel was one of the nobles led out as a child out into exile with King Nebuchadnezzar. And there was a point at which this king who had astrologers and magicians and spiritual people who would give him advice, Daniel was one of those, he had a bad dream. Now, I don't know if he ate some, you know, some old goat or what, but he had a bad dream. And he wakes up and he's deeply troubled. And he says to his magicians, his astrologers, I need you to tell me the meaning of my dream. And they said, oh, king, live forever. We will do this if you will tell us what the dream was. And he said, no, no, no. It's not how this is working. You're going to tell me my dream, and then you're going to interpret it. And if you don't, I'm going to cut you into pieces, and I'm going to turn your houses into rubble. You know, no risk. Like, talk about the blindfold, right? Have you ever tried to read someone's mind and got it really wrong, read their body language and really miss it? Can you imagine being Daniel, standing there realizing that you as one of the young wise men who is spiritually attuned is going to be put to death, cut into pieces, because you don't know what he dreamed about and the interpretation of it? 
I want you to do me a favor. Daniel chapter 2, verse 17 to 49, is a section of Scripture where Daniel responds to this challenge. Sometimes it's easier if you close your eyes or you can look at the little spoky pinwheel as we listen to this Scripture. Two years, listen in. Daniel chapter 2, 17 to 49. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some strength of iron in it, even as you saw, iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. So we see Daniel has this mission impossible. He leans into God and we see an amazing thing come to pass. So what I want to do today is take some time and unpack, work through, get a visual, get an audio on what some of the traits of a prophet are. And I would not invite you to excuse yourself from this grouping of the prophetic because there's traits of a, of a prophet that we as Reformed believers understand we are the priesthood, but we are priest and prophet to one another. We speak sometimes very clearly because the word of the Lord comes out of us because we are filled with his spirit. One of the traits of the prophets is courage. Now, I don't know about you, but did anybody else have that guy in your high school who was a lunatic and courageous beyond reason? Anybody else? 
Yeah, how, how's he doing in jail, right? That guy was crazy. Like, the, if they showed up on a Friday night, you're like, I don't know what's about to happen. Somebody's going to jail tonight because that dude's here. It's going to be fun, but it's going to be dangerous, right? And it's like, I brought my potato gun, and there we are, right? It's just that person. You know them. They'll do anything. And you're like, I wonder if that'd be safe. And then you see him jump off a roof and like, I didn't make it to the other side, you know, and you're in the ER. Courage. But that's a courage rooted in self, There's other people who do this. I don't know if anybody saw the movie Free Solo. It's not about Han Solo. It's not about getting him out of prison. It's about this guy named Alex Honnold who uh, free solo climb without ropes or anything tethering him to life. The 3,000 sheer, like sheer face, granite face of El Capitan in Yosemite. He climbed it without anything. Just stand your granite countertops up and see how you do, right? That's what he did, 3,000 feet up, and he free solo climbed it. And many times during his training, he'd be like, I really have to scissor kick and make this because if I don't, I'll fall. And you would watch him fail and swing from the rope as he trained, and you're like, you're going to do that without ropes, right? Courage. Courage. Or that 14-year-old who's like, Dad, I want to sail around the world alone. To which I'd be like, you're 14. No, you're grounded to your room. Like, I'm not letting that happen, but some fathers are like, sounds good. You seem to be a tyrant. Go for it, right? And they go off and sail like, I wouldn't last 30 minutes on the open ocean alone. I would be salty tears everywhere. Then you see the guy, I remember one, there's a guy who wanted to kayak, kayak, right? Across the ocean from the east coast of Australia to New Zealand. It's like 3,000 miles away. This was his goal. And I'll never forget, dude was brave. He had zinc oxide all over his face to reflect from the sun in case, you know, sunburn. And um, he's leaving the harbor and he's weeping. Just <laughs> He's crying. And I was like, dude, control yourself. But then I look on the shore, the camera pans, and his wife and child are like, <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? How is a kayak worth this? Spoiler alert, they should have cried. He didn't make it. Um, so courage, right? Courage. You can have courage and think, I can do it. That is not prophetic courage. That is not what we're talking about. When we look at Daniel, Daniel had courage in the identity, character, and power of God. Daniel was courageous in what God had for him. He was willing to step forward and say, I will do it. I will take the responsibility of the lives of all the spiritual, the astrologers, all these people, and my friends who are with me from Jerusalem who were taken in exile. I'll take that weight on me. I have courage to own the task. And if I can't do it, all of us die. That is a special breed of cat right there. It's courage, not in their own power. Daniel can't, like, he can't look at Nebuchadnezzar and be like, I think it was a statue with a head of gold. He's not going to figure that out. He had courage in who God was, in God's wisdom, his knowledge, and his ability. And Daniel promised the answer to the king before God gave it. He did not only stake his life on getting the answer. I think this is important. He staked the reputation of the God of Israel before the king of Babylon. He said, I will put my God's reputation on the line before you. I I have that much courage in who he is. And then there's also another trait, dependence. Daniel was dependent on God. Daniel wasn't a self-made man. Daniel was dependent on God. And he realized in this situation, if God doesn't show up, they didn't have trains back then, but it was going to be a train wreck. It was going to be a disaster. It was going to be a horrible situation where hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, would be put to death. And Daniel depended on God. But here's how we see it. He has these friends and he goes to them. He goes to them and he says, pray, pray. The exact uh, quote is, he returned to his house, he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's, this is their Babylonian names. He urged them, plea for mercy from the God of heaven that, they, that he will reveal this mystery and that you and I won't be executed. Pray to God for mercy. He didn't say, um, guys, just, just pray with me that I'm able to have it together and I can really figure this out. 
I just need a grease board and about three hours alone. No, he was dependent and he said, pray, pray for this. And during the night, while he was fully dependent on God, God gave to him a vision. And you heard it in the text. He gave to him a vision. But before Daniel declares the vision to be true, he writes a psalm. He writes a worship song. He pins a hymn to sing to God. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up new ones. He gives wisdom to the wise, right? He makes a song. Think of the courage this takes. Does anybody remember Joe Namath? Anybody? Fur coat wearing Joe? Yeah, he was a quarterback for the New York Jets. And they were the lowly Jets, I mean, some things don't change, but um, they were the Jets, and they were up against the much-vaunted Baltimore Colts, who were quarterbacked by Johnny Unitas, right? So this is a big deal, and there's no really chance that the Jets are going to win. And what did, uh, you know, Broadway Joe do? He guarantees a victory before the game is played. There's a clip of Joe Namath running into the tunnel, holding up one finger after the unlikely Jets beat the vaunted Colts. It was this crazy thing, right? How, how gutsy is that? I guarantee a win. That's what Daniel's doing. He's guaranteeing a win before he gives the word. He hasn't told the king what the dream was. He doesn't know if he's actually right. He just knows the source that spoke to him. He's dependent on God, and then he's courageous because of who he depends on. I think of it like this. I'm assuming that people who are in the running for valedictorian know what the other smart kids, where their grades are at. I wouldn't have known this. I was not part of the valedictorian conversation. Okay, I wasn't allowed at their table. They were like, there's that kid. And I'm like, what, what did I do? You know, maybe I was a kid in jail. Um, but, but, you know, you have this valedictorian races, and I know these kids are, like, really working hard to get that final grade, to, to get above and win the, I don't know, is it a title? Is it an office? It, to all you valedictorians, please help me out. I do not know what you did, but you got a free education probably in college. Um, <laughs> Still making payments. Um, so you, you have this thing where they're trying to get it. Can you imagine a valedictorian candidate coming in with their um, final essay to get graded? They put it down and they say, uh, when you're done reading my essay and grading it, uh, my, my speech for being valedictorian's on top. Just proofread it. You'd be like, okay, little Johnny. A little confident today, aren't we? That's what Daniel did. He was confident. He was courageous because he was dependent. He knew who God was, and he depended on him fully and completely, without reservation and without caveat to say, well, if it doesn't work out, I have this exit plan, right? I have this little way to get out of it. No. He goes in full. He wrote a song of praise declaring to God what he had done which shows us the trait, the third trait. It's humility. The prophet is courageous. They're dependent, but they are humble. Daniel knew his place. Daniel was under no misconception of who he was and who God was. He wasn't thinking how much God needed him. He understood the roles. He was not unmotivated. I mean, Daniel's awesome. He is a pillar of theological belief, prophetic ministry, and life. Daniel, exiled in 586 to Nebuchadnezzar, was also going to serve under King Darius and I believe Xerxes in the Mede Empire and then the Persian Empire. He would go through three different kingdoms running at the number two level. He was the number two to Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, and the following. He, like Usually those people have their head liberated from their shoulders when the kingdom falls. But Daniel, was a, he was a bulwark. The guy was right there all along, faithful, sturdy, stout, and he knew his role, and he was humble. I think people would have said, like, look at this guy. We should, like, hail him as this amazing thing. And Daniel would say, no, no. Everything in Daniel's life, his motivation The thing that drove him to do things was not the idea of how will this work out for Daniel. It was, will this glorify God in the life I live? His intrinsic motivation was the glory of God. Daniel was a role player. 
Now, I'm going to share something that's very hard for me to share because I truly hate them. And I feel like my youngest did this to me today. He didn't know the sermon was being preached. I do not like the New England Patriots. I do not like them. Just, Ethan, he wore his Brady jersey today. I'm like, we're in church, son. All right. Um, I don't like the Patriots. But I do like one Patriot. Right, And you should know, my son likes the Patriots because you like history, and you found out there was a team named after the Revolutionary War Patriots. He didn't leave the Broncos. He just loves America. Bless you, son. And I support your love of our nation, but not... <laughs> Anyways, I could just weep. Um, I like to preach this with my son in a Brady jersey. It's just unbelievable. But I want you to think with me, there is one Patriot that is so well worth looking at, I will use him in a positive light in front of hundreds of people. His name is Julian Edelman. He is not that big. He's not that fast. Now, the dude's got quicks. He's in the NFL. But he is tough. And he is tough in a way that he runs his role. He does a few things. He does them really well. And he's awesome. In the NFL, you have elite receivers right? And they go across the middle, and they're protecting their body, and the ball's just a little above their head, and they're going across the middle. And we may think, why don't you just catch the ball? You know what? You get a 200-pound human missile coming at you. See what you do. But they all get this thing. It's called alligator arms, right? The ball comes, and they're like, oh, I couldn't reach it, right? And they're just like, oh, it's too high. It is. Julian Edelman fully extends, gets bent in half, twists around, springs back up, spins the ball, and walks away. And I'm like, I hate the Patriots, but I love you so much. He's a role player. He knows that he has to catch that ball. It depends on him doing it. When the Patriots are in a tight place, usually against the Broncos, what happens is they'll put him in to catch punts or kickoffs because the dude's sure-handed, and you can hit him in the helmet with a sledgehammer, and for some reason, his little lobster hands don't let go of the ball. When he has to block on a play, he will go out and he will kick out a 260-pound linebacker. And we're not talking 260 pounds of this kind of frame. 4% body fat can lift up a car and throw it to a friend linebacker. And little Julian Edelman will run out and clink, run into him with all his might and block as he should because that's his role. Humility. He's not one of those players doing this. Look at the last name on my jersey. He's the player running back to the huddle. What's next? What's next? What's next? Daniel is that kind of player. Daniel is the kind of guy who goes out and just gets the job done, no matter the expense, the cost, or the fear he feels. He is a role player, and his role and his motivation is to glorify God. He reminds me of a young man named Joseph who was in Pharaoh's court after being pulled out of prison, if you know this story out of Genesis. And Joseph was brought before Pharaoh because Pharaoh had a dream and he couldn't interpret it and it troubled him. And this one guy said, oh, I know a guy in the prison who had, he's a Hebrew, he can interpret dreams. They bring Joseph and think of this, you've been in prison, you're wrongly accused, and they say to you, Pharaoh says, can you interpret my dream? And Joseph says, I cannot. That is not how I would answer I'd be like, just, I'll do anything, get me out of prison. But he says, I cannot, but I know the God who can. When Daniel is brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, this isn't because I'm wise, like all the, more wise than the other people. I cannot interpret your dream, but I know the God who can. I cannot do it, but I know the God who can. And it gives us a warning and it shows a badge of humility for them that they wear as a lifestyle. It is something they are. They are humble. They are always deferring to give God the glory. And it tells us this, be careful if you ever have success in this life, never to share in the glory due only to God. A prophet is courageous, dependent, but humble. And in their state, they know that the glory is due only to the name of God. Never share in or steal God's glory because in the end, that leads to absolute disaster. Absolute disaster in the life of a prophet like Daniel who stands like a pillar holding up a lot of the Old Testament theology, foretelling a lot of what will come in the end times. He is like this huge pillar in the church. It was never about him. It was always about the glory of God. One of the final traits of being a prophet is they're human. They're human. 
And you and I need to hear this. And we need to get it in our ear and understand we can't separate them from a real life. Daniel was a young boy who was taken from his mom and dad, led across the Arabian deserts, either of Jordan or Syria, modern day Syria. He was marched east into the Arabian deserts to a city of Babylon, close to Baghdad. And there he was exiled, trained, and retold what to believe. And he was, all this culture was pushed on him. He was human. He was heartbroken. He was probably scared. He was a person. He lived a real life. Look at the prophets we've talked about. It's like a colonnade of pillars that hold up theology. Jeremiah. But don't forget he was human. God, I'm too young. Nobody will listen to me. Don't forget Jeremiah was a human. Elijah. He was depressed and lonely. That dude went out into the desert, crawled under a broom brush, and tried to die. He was sick of life. He was overwhelmed. He cried out to God, God, there's nobody faithful left. It's only me. He was depressed, and he was lonely. There's Daniel. His life was continually threatened. Think of how many times this dude's head was on the chopping block. When we think of Daniel, we should see some of what goes on. These stories are not just stories, they're his life. Daniel, the one who went into the lion's den. Daniel, friends of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Daniel, the, the advisor to King Belteshazzar, who did something profane and a dismembered hand appears and writes on the wall, meanie, meanie, tickle, you farson. And they're like, what does that mean? Everybody turns white and shakes. And Daniel comes in and says, your life has been weighed, it's been measured, and you came up short. You don't say that to a king unless you're scared to death because you know he's going to liberate your head from your body. You don't say that, but he did. He was courageous. He was dependent. He was humble, but he was human. He was scared. Can you imagine being called into that meeting? Hey, a dismembered hand just wrote on a wall. And you look at it and you're like, this is what it means. How scary that would be. He was a person. Which means for you and I, we have the blessed gift and opportunity to know we stand among giants called to live the same way. They were just people. So now we're in the running. We're in the running with this. Daniel said one time when his life was threatened, he called out to God. Daniel said one time when he was confused in Daniel chapter 8, the end of his life is this series of kind of apocalyptic visions, and he said he got confused. This prophet who knew knew God so well and walked with him so faithfully and had influence and standing and was faithful to God said this in Daniel 12.8, I heard, but I don't understand. So I ask, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Have you ever had that in your life where you're like, I heard it, but I don't understand. Anybody else? God, I heard, but I don't understand how it's gonna come to pass. God, I heard you, but what's gonna happen? What will the outcome of all this be? Lord, help me. Daniel was uniquely human, just like you and I. He was made in the image of God, but he bore all the burdens we bear, the temptations and things. And what's the difference between him and us? Courage, dependence, humility, and a recognition that I'm just dust. This isn't about me. Everything in me should point to the glory of God. And Daniel was so good at being faithful and obedient and trusting the character of God that God would begin to foretell through him the end times the times for you and I that are yet to come. One of the reasons we're doing the the series Listen is because we wanted you as a church to engage and learn the voice of prophecy, see some of the Old Testament prophets and hear what's going on, learn the language because our next step as a church, which starts next week, make sure you grab devotions on your way out if you want it all to make sense, is into the series Believe. And we're gonna step into the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at what the Spirit is saying to the churches and different things. Daniel was given visions of the end times. He was given a vision and given given the ability to speak it out, though he didn't understand it and though much of it would not come to pass in his, his lifetime. He was given that kind of wisdom in the end times. And here's one of the cool things. And this is like something to have on your, you know, like I wish bucket list. 
Jesus quotes Daniel. Read Matthew 24. Can you ever, can you imagine having that, like academia emails you? You were quoted by the Son of God. I just like, yeah, that's going above my degree, right? But here's the thing. Who spoke the word to Daniel in the first place? 500 years before Christ's incarnation, Christ was still speaking into the life of his prophets, declaring what was yet to come, calling forth, and here's what we have to do. We have to wind ourselves back into a mindset to recognize the courage, the dependence, the humility, the humanity is all calling us to one thing that is absolutely a mission possible. It is a mission that is possible for us, the church, priest and prophet one to another, priest and prophet to a culture that is running from God, priest and prophet, knowing that we're literally holding in our hands the very gospel of life wrought by the blood of Jesus on the cross. We hold it, and what are we going to do with it? It is a mission possible, not because you're able, but because you're called through the blood of Christ through the filling of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, to live out your prophetic and priestly duties to declare the word of God in the life you live. Make no mistake that for this church on this day, you are called. And the only response we can give is obedience and trust in the character of God. We have to obey. And you can say, Eric, I can't do it. Great, can you have enough courage to believe in God? Can you have enough courage to believe in him? Can you trust him enough to depend on only God, even though the situation seems dire? Can you have humility when God honors your work and something good happens? Can you do that? Will we, the church, honor God and trust him? I am sick and tired of a culture telling us what our belief should be. We believe in the truth. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior, and we are called to prophetically declare it in word and deed in that world. We shape culture, not the other way. We own the truth. This is our hope, and we are going to stand like pillars in this world and declare the truth of God, or let us call it quits, because this is the church. We have to be courageous We have to be dependent. We've got to stay on our knees before God and know our place. And he will use our everyday, ordinary human life to change this world. I believe it, I've seen it, and I will not excuse you or me from doing it because half of that town in Little Zealand has no religious affiliation. Don't leave here okay with that truth. They don't know him, but you do. It's time for the church to find that burning prophetic voice inside of it and do what God speaks. Say what God moves you to say. It might not make sense. It might be scary. But we have to get over fear and we have to get ourselves out of the viewfinder and get God, make our courage be rooted in God, our dependence only in God, our humility because we know what we are to God and our humanity being used by the divine Father, Son, and for the glory of Jesus Christ. In all that we do, let it be that. I saw it at work this summer in Zambia. My family, uh, Bella was with us, and we had a chance. Erica and I walked to this family's house, and we shared the gospel with them. They were a little family, just little tiny people at this house, and they were standing there, and they were very sad. It was like they had a weight on them, like they were buried under piles of grief, and we shared the gospel. They received the gospel. It was really cool. They had this beautiful little daughter. We're walking away, and they had shared with us that they had a son who had died, And they were just grief-stricken over the loss of this child. They couldn't get over it. Their hearts were wrecked by it. Of course they were, right? Of course they were. And as we're walking away, there was something that lit up inside my daughter. I couldn't see it. I couldn't feel it. And when she said it, I didn't agree with it. But she said, Dad, i got to go back. i got to go back. i got to tell them something. There's something that God wants them to hear. And I was like, Okay, so we turn around and we go back to the house. She goes up to this little lady and she says to her, you will see your baby again. Because remember, they had just received eternal life and heard the promise. But in her mind, culturally, that baby was living under the waters of the Zambezi River in some horrible, demonic, scary place. And Bella said, you will see your daughter or your son again. 
God has mercy on those who are too young to make a choice. You will see them again. It was like watching weights fall off a person. She just like beamed in the middle of the hot African sun. They were glowing because a prophetic word had been spoken into their life by a 14-year-old young lady who couldn't do anything but obey and trust that God was moving. Will you do the same? I cannot bear the idea that we have this much momentum as a church and we'll let that community go to hell, half of them, because we're comfortable. No, no. Let the prophetic word ring here. It's our job. It's our calling. We get to be the colonnade of faith and hold the faith up in obedience, courageous dependence, and the reality that we are just bit part players. I invite you today, obey him, trust him. He's not only for you, he's for them. We must be a church willing to take the impossibly courageous step forward into obedience into him who formed us in the womb according to his purposes, not ours. Uncomfortable? Absolutely. Man, we're going to change this world. We're going to change this world, not for our glory, but because Jesus Christ died to save them. Amen? Lord Jesus Christ, today we declare that this victory that we hold on to over death and sin is yours. You, you won it for us. Today we declare that the victory of seeing people who don't know you coming home to Christ, that is yours. It is finished. And we claim that today, God, that your victory will come to pass. So we pray, God, that you would chase out of us religious cowardice that justifies something you don't excuse. That you would work out of us for the sake of your victory. The justifications, the excuses, and the absolute lack of love for those whom you love so dearly. God, may we be a church who not only stands with our arms open wide, but a church that is being remade into the image of Jesus Christ. We are no longer just us. We are a new creation. So we claim that victory today. And we hold fast in this moment. And we ask, give us the courage to obey. Give us the dependence to trust. Come Holy Spirit. Fill your church and do a work that you deeply desire in the world beyond these walls. That many sons and daughters would come home to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up and sing this with me as a declaration? Make no excuse, make no justification. You are priest and prophet in that world, in this room, one to another. I love that Matthias is, Matthias is here on a prophetic word spoken to, some, to Stephanie in her office. Sometimes we just have to have courage in him and get over ourselves. I challenge you, church, to remove yourself from the equation and live obediently. You'll do the weirdest things ever. I remember parking my car to go obediently for some reason pick up a York peppermint, pa uh, peppermint patty wrapper on the ground. I'm like, what am I doing? And it was like it was burning inside of me. I was like, this is the weirdest thing ever. So I pick it up. I'm like, a little silver metal. I don't even know what you're doing out here. I throw it in the trash can. I walk back to my car talking to myself. And I'm like, Lord, why? This makes no sense. No sense. Nobody got saved. I don't know anything came of it other than people think, that dude talks to himself. I don't understand it. But I sat for a minute and played this scenario in my head. What if one person was sitting in that parking lot and said, God, if you have any interest in me, have some random dude come pick that wrapper up. What if we lived on that razor's edge of priest and profit to the world. We don't have to know it all. We just have to be courageous in the one who can accomplish anything, dependent on the one who will provide, humble because it's not about us, and let this everyday ordinary human life be used for the glory of God the Father through the power of the Spirit for the glory of the Son. Amen? As you go from this place, let your lives be challenged to live faithfully for him who died for you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sorry for yelling a little bit on baptism. You are dismissed.
We hope that you found today's teaching to be uplifting and encouraging, but also very challenging for you and your spiritual walk with Christ. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's teaching, make sure that you click the link below because that'll take you to our weekly devotions. And devotions are a vital part of what we do here at the Foundry Church. So be sure to do that. Thanks again for joining us and we cannot wait to see you again next week.